when we think about TCP, you know, if there, you're going to have two parties communicate, again, we'll just go with this concept of A and B. It could be router A, router B, computer A, computer B. When one computer wants to talk to the other computer, <clears throat> when we take a look at the TCP IP model, IP gives us global reachability from one computer to the other. Once you get to that actual computer, it's just like getting to a building. You know, you could go down to Fifth Avenue in New York City, and you can get to the right building. Well, that building might have many offices. The TCP or UDP ports are bound. These are also called sockets. They're bound to a service, right? It's bound to SMTP, whatever your SMTP server is. It's bound to HTTP. It's bound to SSH or Telnet. So in order to communicate between A and B, <clears throat> we have to establish this TCP socket. And that's where we do um, a three-way handshake. That's where we establish sequence numbers. This is, again, eventually where we'll send fin and resets once it's torn down. Um, once you do the three-way handshake, you can then talk to the application layer. We don't spend a lot of time in the networking world looking at the application layer. We just kind of lump together five through seven. You know, how are you presenting data to the other side? What's the application actually doing with the code and memory? <clears throat> a lot of times we just kind of bundle this together as what's called layers five through seven. Well, in order for layers five through seven, think about things like SMTP, Simple Mail Transfer Protocol, HTTP, <clears throat> FTP, Remote Desktop Protocol, VNC, the list goes on and on. All these services rely upon TCP establishing a session. If you don't first complete this three-way handshake, you're never actually going to talk to that HTTP server. How are we doing so far? Does this all feel like a review to everybody? I'm hoping this all sounds pretty familiar. Um, everything up until this point is just review. What we're going to do is we're going to take our basic understanding of TCP IP today and say, you know what, if there was a third party, C, and C was man in the middle. We talked about how to do that before, right? We can do art poisoning. We can do sketchy stuff with DHCP. We can do st sketchy stuff with spanning tree. And everybody's keeping up, or at least mostly keeping up. Okay, good. So imagine that you've got a man in the middle, and they're actually watching this. We sometimes call it eavesdropping. So you're sitting here, you've got access to the wire, you see other people's data go back and forth, you witness the three-way handshake. You see these sequence numbers increment, and you can maintain state table as man in the middle. In other words, you know that A is talking to B on port 25. You know the sequence number is currently 137. What that means, and this is where we can take what we learned yesterday and kind of build upon it. I can do an art poisoning to host A. And I can basically say, hey, you were talking to the gateway before. Or maybe if B was on the same local subnet, you were talking to B. Well, guess what? That IP address now equals my MAC address. And he goes, oh, wow, really? OK, awesome. And he updates his ARP cache. And at this point, anytime A tries to talk to B, he winds up really sending his communication to C. What happens next? Because TCP is stateful, we can tear down the session. I can say, I'm all done communicating with you. That knocks A offline. But what I do, because I know the sequence number, is that I can start sending communications to B on port 25 using the exact same sequence number where we just left off, allowing me to effectively hijack their communication session. So where would you ever use this? Um, TCP session hijacking is useful against clear text protocols. If encryption is being used end to end, hijacking the session isn't going to do any good because once we take over the session, we're supposed to inject data in. If we don't have the right cipher suite, if we don't have the encryption keys, our data is not going to work. So this works really good with clear text applications. Telnet would be a premium example, but we know not to use Telnet because it's insecure. We should use SSH. 
Well, in some environments, people have devices that can only do telnet. Might be an older piece of hardware. Might be um, a remote warehouse or a remote uh, manufacturing plant. And it could be in a country where you're not allowed to have encryption. There's uh, export licenses against, against encryption against lots of other countries. So let's say that we've got a warehouse in Russia or China or Syria. Maybe we can't do SSH. We can't use our default cipher suite. <clears throat> so what do we do? We use Telnet. And we know that Telnet's not good. <clears throat> Excuse me. Because it's all in clear text. But what you can do to defend this is use S key to create one-time passwords. And the idea of a one-time password is that when host A is talking to host B on port 23, right, for Telnet, whenever it asks it for username and password, the password that we're going to send is a one-time password, meaning it only gets used one time. And then you scratch it off of a list. And the next time you authenticate, you scratch it off of a list again. This keeps us secure because the protocol itself is insecure. If anybody was ever monitoring our packets and stole the password, it would be too late. Because once you use that password and you set up your session, the password's no longer any good. This is a perfect example for session hijacking. So I see A log into B. They use their one-time password. I take over the session. I art poison to get A to send his traffic to C now. Once again, <clears throat> I do a fin reset to tear down the session. As far as the administrator at A, looks like he got disconnected. It's just weird. But as far as B is concerned, the session is still established. Why? Because C was monitoring the connection. He understands what the sequence numbers are. So when he hijacks, he tells the upstream device, hey, if you were trying to get to A, a equals my MAC address. So you can art poison in both directions. And because we know the sequence numbers of an established session, I can basically hop into somebody else's telnet session and just take it over. So this whole concept of what I'm showing you is called TCP hijacking. And again, this has been around for probably, I think I learned about this like 20 years ago. It was better when I first learned about it because people were using more clear text protocols. Today, we look at this and we go, man, that's really complicated attack that has a small footprint. Like there's only so many scenarios where this is really going to work. It's kind of limited and it's a little bit technologically complex.